On December 15, 2021, Congressman Tom McClintock found his wife, Lori, unresponsive inside their home. Her death was sudden and shocking. Lori was just 61 years old. She was a successful real estate agent, and many people say that she played an important role in her husband's career. Now, a year after her death, the coroner finally revealed what may have killed her. Lori McClintock died in 2021 of dehydration caused by, quote, and this is the medical examiner, adverse effects of a white mulberry leaf ingestion. A partially intact white mulberry leaf was found in Lori's stomach. So what exactly is white mulberry leaf? White mulberry, it turns out, is a dietary supplement. It's regularly promoted as a diet aid that can curb cravings and lower blood sugar. Lori had no warning. In wanting to do something healthy for her body, she consumed something that ended up killing her. I don't think we have the safety that people hope and expect for the supplement market. And what you need is a stronger law that requires companies to say what they're marketing and let the FDA at least be aware and be able to say that ingredient's illegal. That's Josh Sharfstein. And that's quite an admission from a man who was a former principal deputy commissioner at the FDA. So in this episode, we're going to learn all about the Wild West of dietary supplements, why Americans are so addicted to them, why this industry remains so loosely regulated, and when these supplements may go from helpful to harmful. This is Body Unboxed, and I'm your host, Anahat O'Connor. I'm here with our resident expert, Professor Joan Salji Blake. Thanks, Anahat. You know, it's rare that I'm speechless, but that story is why we are doing this episode, because we don't ever want to have that happen to any of our family or friends. It's horrifying, and that's the thing, is it can happen to almost anyone because so many people take dietary supplements. And that's why this is the topic of this week's episode. Supplements are supposed to be helpful. We're told from a young age to get our vitamins and minerals. We see ads on television telling us to take fish oil supplements to get omega-3 fatty acids. In fact, 58% of Americans report taking dietary supplements. Often they're motivated by a wish to improve or maintain their health. But... Are they really all they're cracked up to be? Dr. Joan, do you take any dietary supplements? Well, when I remember, okay, I do take a, a daily multivitamin mineral supplement because, you know, something, I have some gaps in my diet that I think a vitamin mineral supplement is helpful for me. I have to say that I have a medicine cabinet that's also stocked with a lot of uh, dietary supplements that I've taken over the years. I've taken magnesium and taken fish oil and uh, turmeric and, you know, multivitamins. And Dr. Joan, you spoke with two people who are deeply involved in this world of supplements and supplement regulation, in fact, which is the really important element of this. First, I chatted with Joshua Sharfstein. He's the vice dean for public health practice and community engagement at Johns Hopkins. But get ready for this. He's also a former deputy commissioner at the FDA. As a nutrition professor here at Boston University, yeah, I know some people need supplements. I mean, some people really, really need supplements. So just can you just give us an overview of sort of like what supplements are? Well, thanks for having me. And let me say some people do need supplements and some people maybe don't need supplements as much as that they're taking. Certainly, I occasionally take lactase because I'm lactose intolerant. Helps me eat the occasional ice cream. So I appreciate the ability to do that. And uh, it is an enormous market right now. And unfortunately, I think it's a market that is not as safe as people hope it to be. About 100 years ago, I was in private practice for nutrition counseling. And I used to say to my clients, OK, the, you know, before you come to see me, bring in any vitamin, mineral supplements that you're taking. And I'll never forget this person that came in with a supermarket bag full of these supplements. I look at, as, and I'm saying to myself, OK, let's sit down. You know, let's, we're going to go through this. And you know, stuff. I'm about to save you a lot of money because your vitamin, mineral supplements 
should fit into your lunch bag and you should have plenty of room left over for your lunch. So right away, we're probably looking at that. And that's what the problem is, is that so many people are taking more than they need to the point where not only are they thinning their wallet, but it can potentially be harmful. So how are these vitamin supplements regulated? So it may start to be easier in in describing this by, by saying what they're not regulated like. People have an idea of how drugs are regulated. You can't market a drug until it is studied in humans and the FDA reviews all the evidence and decides that the benefits exceed the risks. That's really the key standard. Does this help people's health and does that benefit exceed the potential for side effects? Which is a good thing, which is a very good thing that drugs are regulated that way. I I would agree with you there. I think it's, it's very, very important because before they were regulated that way, People were out there saying all sorts of things worked for cancer and heart disease. And famously for diabetes, there was a product that was really worthless that was being marketed for diabetes, you know, for at a time when there was no cure for diabetes. But then there was a treatment for diabetes that that was invented, insulin, and people kept selling this other product. And so, you know, that's why it's really important to be really careful when people say, hey, this will treat your diabetes because Even if it's a harmless product, if it keeps someone from using insulin that could save their lives, there's a big consequence to that. And so that that is the structure for drug regulation, more or less. And now we have um, supplements being treated very differently. So vitamin supplements are regulated uh, by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States Mm -hmm. under a series of uh, laws, um, most notably a law called DSHEA that was passed in 1994. And they're not regulated like drugs. So supplements, there is no requirement for human testing. There is no review of data before the FDA allows marketing. In fact, companies can just put products on the market. There is a list of which kinds of products are allowed on the market. Vitamins are allowed to be marketed. Certain herbal uh, supplements, particularly if they've been on the market before, are allowed to be marketed. They can be combined in different ways. And companies are allowed to make what are called structure function claims. So they can't say it cures a disease or prevents a disease or treats a disease, but they can say it like boosts your immune system, for example, something that kind of seems a little strange or it helps, you know, your heart health in some some vague way. But those claims aren't really vigorously vetted by the Food and Drug Administration. The companies are supposed to have some evidence on hand to support that before they can make those statements, but they don't have to share that evidence with the FDA particularly, nor does the FDA review it. But there is a bright line and companies are not supposed to say essentially that their products are for treating, preventing, curing diseases because that would make them drugs. And it creates right. that whole problem that we would have before. So to, to come out and go like, take uh, this vitamin, if you have COVID, it's really good to make you feel better. That would be an unapproved drug claim and the FDA would be unhappy about it. And I think for good reason, because when you got COVID, you really should be basing a decision on what to take on evidence that is rigorously vetted and reviewed by the Food and Drug Administration. You got that right, because delaying getting the right treatment can be really, really costly. So that's great. I'm so glad that you explained that, because I think sometimes people think that vitamins and minerals supplements are regulated as closely as that, and they are not. As I said in the beginning, that some people do need supplements, and so they are good. You know, you know, like folic acid... I think there are a few different potential problems, but you're right. There are certain conditions where it is really helpful to be taking vitamins and supplements. There are certainly vitamin deficiencies. Uh, We see in children, iron deficiency, breastfed babies sometimes uh, need vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So there, there are definitely conditions where this makes sense. But for the most part, a balanced diet covers a lot of nutritional needs for people. And you don't necessarily have to line up every vitamin and make sure you're taking it in a pill because you're getting it in your diet most of the time. That's correct. And there's benefits from a healthy diet that go beyond just having a pill. There's other things in the diet that work together to make them um, healthy. When you said that the vitamins, you know, something may happen, that the, the FDA is basically not scrutinizing every solitary vitamin or supplement that gets onto the market, things could go wrong, right? Yes. Things could go wrong. And and so how does the FDA know mm-hmm. like supplement A went wrong and caused health or caused harm? The challenge for supplements is the FDA doesn't even know what supplements are on the market. There's no requirement to even tell the agency 
that you're marketing a supplement. I tell my students in class, they can go online and there's some websites and they can put a label on it and they could be selling a supplement that afternoon or as soon as the package arrives. And what could go wrong? Well, one of the things that could go wrong is, you know, just generally people could take too much of something. And another thing is that there are some ingredients out there where the safety really hasn't been well established in humans and people could get sick from them depending on the ingredient. And that certainly has happened. A third thing that could go wrong is that the supplements show up and they don't have what's in them, you know, what's supposed to be in them actually in them. And in fact, they could have things like allergens or other contaminants in the supplement and people could get harmed that way. And then there's the possibility that there are pharmaceuticals hiding out in products sold as supplements. And, you know, you can find the latest products in this genre um, online at the FDA. They've got a constant stream of products often marketed for sexual enhancement or losing weight or bulking up sometimes all three at once. And they really are relying on essentially Viagra or steroids or weight loss drugs, you know, but they're hiding out in supplements. And, those products can cause very serious problems, particularly if the dose is inappropriate, if the patients aren't, you know, are at risk for side effects, or sometimes they're pharmaceutical analogs. They're not even Viagra, but it's Viagra tweaked, so it doesn't show up like Viagra. And that chemical might actually be quite dangerous uh, to certain right. people too. And especially if the person is taking Viagra and they say, gee, I'm going to take this one on top of it, I can imagine... Right. Or maybe the doctor says, your heart's not healthy enough for Viagra. Then they go out and they take, you know, sexy time, magic, all natural supplement. And then before you know it, they're having all those side effects. To be clear, I'm making that name up. But if you look online, it would be one of the tamer ones. And uh, there have been times where people have taken a supplement and had harm. The FDA catches up with them. I mean, real harm, including death, catches up with them you know, sends them a letter, right, and tells them to stop selling it. They could be fined them millions of dollars. But if you're making billions of dollars and you find a million dollars, they could actually, you know, shut down the shop online or whatever. And then a month or two later, come up with another name and we re- re- go back into business. Yeah. And, you know, it, unfortunately, recalled products are often still for sale in the United States. And, that, and that's been found. So it's just we're stuck with this challenge where people want to take supplements. There are benefits for certain supplements to people. People certainly perceive a lot of benefits, but there's not, I think, the assurance of safety that people generally want. One of the things that I've always found interesting in surveys of people about supplements is you ask people, are they interested or how important is it that the FDA thinks the supplement works? Do they really want to know whether the FDA has approved a supplement? And most people who take supplements say, it doesn't really matter to me that much. You know, the FDA can tell me it boosts my immune system. I don't, you know, or that it doesn't, but I really think it does. So I'm going to take it, you know, so something like 75% of the people are not as interested in what the FDA says. But if you ask people, do you expect the FDA to keep the supplement supply safe? It flips. And 80% of the people say, yes, I think that I want my supplements to be safe. If there's something unsafe, I don't want it for sale. I want the FDA to take action against it. And so the the concept, I think, for supplements is not benefit versus risk. It's access with safety. And that's a, that's a different kind of balance. And I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we have the safety that people hope and expect. But I wonder if the message should be, you know, FDA will make sure that it's safe, but you really need to be talking with a healthcare provider, especially a registered dietitian nutritionist, to make sure that you need it and it's not going to do you any harm based on your medical health and your personal you know, history. I think that would be great, although I don't think FDA can make sure that it's safe right now. I think that the, the way the law is written and the rules that govern the agency, it's just very hard. If you don't even know it's being marketed, products can stay on the market after they're recalled. If you have this problem of, you know, product after product that is essentially masquerading as a supplement, but spike with pharmaceuticals, it creates a problem for the supplement market and it creates the the potential for more 
outbreaks of liver failure, more, you know, people seriously harmed. And so I think we have to do better to get to that access to safety than we're at right now. You got my vote. Uh, you, you alluded to this before and how this flipped and changed. You say that how the heck did these vitamin supplements get so like the wild, wild west? And it was the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act in 1994 that flipped this. Well, I'm not so sure that it was such a flip at that point. You know, supplements and vitamins have been sold throughout American history. And it's always been a challenge for regulators to figure out what to do with them. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of challenges to the FDA in the years prior to 1994. The FDA had suggested some more aggressive actions and that led Congress to push back pretty hard. But I view this as kind of a continuum of push and pull between the supplement and vitamin industry and regulators that goes back at least 100 years. And 1994 was a kind of a step in that direction. And since that time, there have been other laws passed. You know, the supplement companies have to report serious adverse events after they failed to do that for a particular supplement, and a lot of people got hurt. They have to have their facilities inspected. There are some other provisions that now apply to foods, including dietary supplements, as a result of some legislation that passed for food safety, like good manufacturing practices. So there are a few more provisions. But there's still not even a requirement that FDA know what's on the market. And there's, it's still very, very difficult for FDA to move on products that they know or they suspect are harmful. So for example, if there's a product that the FDA is looking at and goes, you know, this kind of looks like it might have Viagra in it, they have no information about it. It becomes a chemistry experiment for FDA. And I remember when I worked at FDA meeting, I think it was a chemist or a graduate student in a PhD program who had done extensive chemical work to find all these different versions of Viagra in different supplements. And they were all illegal and it took her a long time to do. And it was a really great chemistry project, but like it required that level of chemistry before the FDA could take action. And, and so sometimes people say like, well, the FDA, you know, th these products are legal. Why can't the FDA just take them off the market? But if you don't know they're illegal, you don't even know they're being sold. Then it's like a fig leaf of regulation. It's not really actual regulation. And what you need is a stronger law that requires companies to come forward and say what they're marketing and make, let the FDA um, not do a drug-like review, not treat it right. like a drug, but um, at least be aware and be able to say, wait a second, that ingredient's illegal. See, that makes all the sense in the world. Let's Can can we find common ground here? All right, so you don't, you don't have to go through the clinical trials like you just said, like drugs, which we know are really expensive and they take a heck of a lot of time. But we can't have the wild, wild west where they're just putting anything out there and the FDA doesn't even know what's out there. There's got to be something in between. So it, it sounds to me what you just said, to just register it, I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to make, ABC Company is going to make this supplement and it is going to have blank and it's going to have blank of this amount. And it's, this, these are the ingredients that's in it and boom. So is there something that could go on a vitamin, a mineral supplement or I think a QR code would be a great idea. And so, for yeah. example, you're in a store, you pull out your phone, you look at it and, you know, you swipe it. First of all, the store could swipe it and it might say not registered, not linked to the FDA website, not whatever. And then it's like, well, we shouldn't sell it. Right. And then that, a, a consumer could do that and say, oh, OK, here are the, here's what's actually in there, according to the manufacturer. You know, maybe that's all it says. Maybe at the bottom it says. Um, there's a warning for pregnant women taking this supplement, or there's a warning if you have heart problems for the supplement, or maybe it's just like, you know, the FDA is open to safety investigation on the basis of A, B, and C. So people can get information that would help them. It would also perhaps give the manufacturers an opportunity to share the evidence that they base their structure function claim on. So we're saying that it boosts your immune system based on this study or that study, or if, you know, if they, if they wanted to do that. So it could be a way to pull in information and inform consumers and give them the access that they want, but also I think strengthen the safety that they also want. I totally love that who's ever selling at the shop, and it could be anywhere from a drugstore to Amazon, doesn't sell it unless 
that it has been registered by the FDA or on their website, and it is being tracked. Because this way, the consumer, who is so busy and doesn't have a background in supplements like you and I have, can say, whew, somebody else is, you know, uh, watching this for me so I can, I can, you know, take a breath. Right. I mean, th- there will obviously be some disclaimers because people mm-hmm. can't assume it's the same level of oversight as drugs. Now, here's a really important point, because there have been proposals for this kind of Ooh. listing requirement. And in fact, some people in the supplement industry have spoken out in favor of them. Other countries do something like this. So this is not a crazy, wild idea that we've come up with. This is an idea that's pretty reasonable, I think. And there are different kinds of proposals. One of the proposals is to just let it be open to companies. They list it however they want. And then the listings just stay up there. I'm not a huge fan of that approach because what if pe- people could actually under that theory list banned ingredients, you know? And so to me, like there have to be some constraints on what people can list. You can't, shouldn't be able to list something that is illegal. If people have multiple times marketed things that weren't what they said it was at all, or had pharmaceuticals in there inappropriately, then maybe there should be some sanction on them where they get a special review before they can start listing things again. I think it's a mechanism to take away some of that risk that exists and provide a greater assurance of safety, even if we can't get to a perfect assurance of safety. Well, this has been so informational. I can't thank you enough. And and I know that so many people, well, we know, I know we know, spending billions of dollars on this, that I think that more education to the consumer needs to be out there. Yeah, and I would say that there is a path, I think, for people to come together to maintain and promote access to supplements that people want while enhancing safety. And sometimes people are of the attitude like any kind of move towards safety, they're going to take them all off the market. You know, we're going to suddenly be regulating them as drugs. And I think we have to move beyond that to trying to get to shared goals. And I think access with safety is a shared goal and that there are policies that can get us closer to that. I think we should have a dinner party, invite everybody involved, and we'll all sit down and talk about this because really it would be good for the consumer and I think it'd be good for everyone. Uh, I'll bring my lactase in case there's ice cream served. So with that, I want to thank Dr. Joshua Sharfstein for coming to us. Again, an MD and professor of public health at John Hopkins. And boy, that was really, really insightful information. So thank you again. Thanks for having me. But Joan, I'm interested in the history and how we got here. You spoke to someone who can really give us an insight there, I think, right? Right, that's right. I also spoke with Dr. David Sears, a professor of medicine at Columbia University Medical Center, and he certainly had some insight into how we got where we are today. Well, back in the early 90s, and this was really the work of Orrin Hatch, who was a senator from Utah, where most of the dietary supplement factories were and where his son owned one, uh, he put together a bilateral coalition to pass what's called the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. And in this law, they took away any ability of the FDA to regulate dietary supplements. They put in weak guidelines that basically say that you can't claim to treat a disease. And so they left the the supplement industry regulated only by their fear of hurting people, and for which they, they don't have much, it seems, and made it impossible to regulate the industry other than through things like suits, lawsuits for advertising fraud or for violating the provisions that say that you can't claim to treat a disease. What's interesting about this is that everybody thought it was a good idea because it was couched under the the sort of umbrella of its nutrition. How could it be bad for you? And in fact, it might be good for you and people should have the right to do whatever they want. And if you really want to have a laugh, if you Google Mel Gibson and dietary supplements, there's a, a YouTube video of his TV commercial. In it, he, there, you know, uh, it's dark, it's outside, there's a SWAT team that arrives, it, they, they go in, they break in, they go through the house, and scary music is playing, and finally they come across Mel Gibson in the kitchen, and he's holding a bottle of, of vitamins, and he says, guys, it's just vitamins, and then 
scary music and, and, and Mel Gibson's voice. If you don't want to lose your vitamins, make the FDA stop. Call the U.S. Senate and tell them that you want to take your vitamins in peace. If enough of us do that, it'll work. That ad has been verified to have gotten more letters written to Congress than the entire Vietnam War. Sad. That is very sad. What you're saying here is that manufacturers of vitamin supplements or any other kind of supplements, is kind of herbal supplements too, can basically just put out there something as long as they don't make a claim that it can prevent a disease right. um, and just put it out there. And there's the FDA isn't really aware of these supplements when they go out there. And I mean, they're, 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 they're very aware. They just can't do anything about them. So really, and it's up to then the, the supplement maker to make sure that the supplement is get, getting you what you want. It is not making sure there's nothing in it that could be hazardous to your health. So they're kind of overseeing the product and the FDA doesn't hear about it unless something goes wrong. Right. And I would, I would sort of, the way you've said it, I would adjust a little bit. The dietary supplement company is under no obligation whatsoever to ensure that you are going to get something that will do what it says. And they're only responsible if they hurt somebody, if somebody sues them. You know, that's, it's mind-boggling to me, David, because this is like the wolf that is you know, guarding the chicken coop and he's dreaming about chicken parmesan for dinner. You know what I mean? Like he's like, there's no who's policing this. Right. And, and that's, the, that's the real problem when public isn't really even aware that there's uh, not any regulatory oversight. You know, they're allowed to say a lot of things that are very suggestive, supports heart health. That has zero meaning whatsoever. It does not mean that supplementation has shown to make heart health better. It is more reflective of the fact that if there really is a deficiency, there might be a heart problem. But it really doesn't do anything for heart problems if you aren't deficient. And, and there, there's so many examples like this. This product was designed to, that's another one of my favorite wordings, was designed to, yeah, okay, that's fine. It was designed to, but does it? And nobody knows. And again, I mentioned that there are there are instances where people have been hurt. That's right. You know, these supplements, if you go down the supplement aisle, you know this, my goodness, it's like you can stay there a week trying to read everything on the supplement aisle. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. And, you know, I, I was reading that um, between the 2008 and 2011, the FDA got about over 6,000 adverse reports about people taking supplements and something went wrong. And and when one of the adverse reports reports was death. I'm like, wait a minute, that's not a good adverse report. You know what I mean? Like death is like, that's really serious. So it's mind boggling to me that um, it gets to the level you have to have adverse reports before they jump in and do something. So tell us, you fix this for us, David, fix it. How can we fix this system? Well, I, you know, the best I can do is talk about it. And I do, I talk about it and I, I write about it and I, try to educate as many people as will listen. If I were able to, I would try to reverse some of the components of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. Uh, I think it's probably too hard of a sell to try and treat supplements exactly the way we do medications, requiring very large randomized controlled trials, because the supplements, unless the government is paying for it, the supplement companies are, are not going to because they're, they're not expensive the way a lot of medications are. And these studies are very expensive. So I think that we need more research for funding good randomized trials with the supplements. We need better regulation of herbage that the supplement companies can use. I'm speaking practically. Now, for me, ideally, and for the best and safest approach, it would be that no, no supplement would be on the market without good randomized controlled data that proved both its safety and efficacy. And unfortunately, that would probably do in the majority of the supplement companies. What's really troublesome is the is the number of companies that are out there that are really right on the edge of fraud in the way that they promote their products, 
and many that are really actually fraudulent and, and have been involved in some of the litigation against some of these companies, the things that they say are just, just outlandish and often find credible spokespeople, physicians and so forth, who are willing to add their reputations to their marketing. And perhaps innocently, they don't realize how ineffective and potentially dangerous these things are. I mean, this is the whole reason why we had you on here and why we're talking about this, because unfortunately, the consumer doesn't understand that this could be the wild, wild west when it comes to supplements. And so, you know, it's a shame that somehow there can't be some kind of easy way that the the consumer, when they go in there, to look at this label and know that it's safe. Right. Well, you bring up a couple of interesting points. One is that there's been a lot of questioning of what the accuracy of the labeling and what's in the in the pills in the manufacturing process and so forth. Uh, the Attorney General of New York sued some of the botanical companies um, because they couldn't find any of the botanicals claimed to be in pills based on a certain kind of testing. Uh, this was some years ago. There is at least one company that is allowing their product to be tested by USP. USP, which stands for United States Pharmacopeia, is a uh, an organization devoted to medication safety and so forth. And so that will tell you whether or not what it says on the label is actually what's in the pill. But you said the word safety. And and just because you now know what's in the pill is what's supposed to be in the pill, that doesn't mean that it's either safe or effective. So this is a step in the right direction to have these supplements uh, voluntarily regulated by uh, USP, for instance. That's a decent first step just to make sure that you are getting what you pay for. But it shouldn't confuse people to think that what they're getting will do what they think it will do and we'll do it safely. So, you know, you want to get a product that is what you think it is, but the first question is, do I need a product? And that's why we have healthcare providers, doctors and registered dietitians to help someone to decide that before they start taking all these supplements. The other thing I wanted to talk about is that we're having a real problem with scientific credibility lately. And in fact, I think that scientific credibility is at such a low that it was very easily politicized. And I think that that hurts people in the aggregate. I think many people have been very seriously harmed by believing things that are not credible or proven in favor of things that are. And we're, we're working on that as well. Dr. Joan, I think we learned some really important things from your interview with Dr. Sears. And you, you talked about, you know, how it's important for people to, you know, talk to their healthcare providers about these things. And uh, I've seen studies showing that oftentimes healthcare providers will ask people, you know, what pills or medicines are you taking? And people are just thinking about prescription drugs and they don't tell their doctors the long list of dietary supplements they're on because they don't think of them as medicines or pills, but they can have, you know, essentially medicinal effects on your body if you take them in these large doses. It's so important that the consumer understands how supplements are regulated or really not regulated. A person's mm. supplement needs are based on their personal health, medical history, and their diet. And that's why you really need to be talking to somebody who can really give you some advice about what you really need. And remember, my favorite hashtag is some may be good, but more may not be better. So definitely mm. speak with your health care provider and a registered dietitian dietitian, nutritionist to get personalized recommendations based on your needs. All right. Excellent advice. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Joan. And we've heard from a number of experts today, and we hope you found these conversations both educational and entertaining. Uh, but remember, we're not providing you individual medical advice. So take your family's medical questions to your doctor, especially before starting any new diet or health routine. And for medical emergencies, make sure you contact emergency services. Thank you so much for joining us today on Body Unboxed by Pearson. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss out on any episodes or that bonus content, free chapters from Joan's book, Nutrition and You. It's a wonderful book and a resource that I use often. We'll be back next week with another fascinating episode on protein. Body Unboxed is produced by Neon Hum Media. 
Our lead producer is Alexandra De Palma. The executive producer is Shara Morris.